This is a reading of God's word. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with the man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean, the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. This is the word of God. God. I'm going to try. I started with this, the first service. I'm going to start this message with this, singing this song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons have Father Abraham. I am one of them. So are you. And let's all praise the Lord. You know this song, right? After that, like, right, I'm left, I'm feet, turn around, right? All of a sudden, it becomes like some sort of Christian spiritual hokey pokey dance. <laughs> all right? Out of nowhere. And you know this children praise song. A few weeks ago, I was working on this text. And the sermon was getting too long because this is, as I told you, is a really hard text. It's a complicated, hard um, text to understand. So as I was working on this and he was trying to explain this, it was getting too long. So I decided to cut this in half, making it to the two sermons with more details provided to them. Uh, but that week, I had to preach on another message because it was a Thanksgiving Sunday. But I knew that this message was coming, so I was working on this. And that week, I was surprised because as I was working on this text, jotting down some ideas and points from this text, my younger one came into my office during the weekday. And suddenly, she was singing that song out of nowhere, Father Abraham. So I was like, I asked, oh, why did you just sing this song right now? Because I really named this message that I was going to preach after that song, as you can see. It's like, why did you just sing the song? And she was like, oh, we just learned this song from children's ministry last week. I was like, what? <laughs> I named this sermon after that song. Father Abraham had many sons. And that is not just about Isaac, Jacob, and 12 children and all. Actually, the song says, I am one of them, so are you. And let's all praise the Lord because of that. So the question is, why is that a reason to praise God? Being the children of Abraham. Why is that so? And who... What people are considered to be the sons of Abraham? Being one of the children of Abraham, does it really matter? Is that significant and important? Let's dive into that today. And I told you, it is not going to be easy, so I want you to stay focused. This text and the following text, I'm going to talk about it, which I will talk about law next week, Lord willing. 
you may feel like, this is theological class, what is this? But there's a reason why the Lord gave me this uh, tough text to us. That he wants us and you to know and learn from this. This is God's word for us. Not just for scholars, not for the Galatian believer only, for you and me too. So let's try to learn from here. Let me try to pick up where we left off last week. I'm trying to follow that. Remember? Now, last week I said, Paul proved that the salvation is only by faith in Jesus Christ, not faith in Jesus plus the works of the law. It's not the combination of those two. Not both of them are required by believing in Jesus Christ. And Paul tried to make the point to the Galatian believers by reminding them of their own experiences. In the Trinitarian triune God, point of grace, saying in verse 1, the cross of Jesus Christ was publicly, vividly portrayed before you, and Paul was reminding them about the work of the Son, Jesus Christ, what he has done for you. And then in verse 2, Paul says, remember that you received the Holy Spirit? Remember how you received the Holy Spirit. It was not by you doing some work, but simply by believing it, hearing and believing you received the Holy Spirit. And verse 5, God the Father supplied the Holy Spirit to you and did the wonderful works and miracles in your life, blessings in your life, simply by because you believed. So Son, Holy Spirit, Father, Paul made this Trinitarian explanation in their lives. And then Paul moves on to this. Paul tried to explain the point from the scripture now, making his argument why it is so according to the Bible, the Old Testament there. So this is the second part of that. Number two, Paul's argument from the scripture. And the first point I want to make is this. The gospel was promised, gospel promise was given to Abraham and to his offspring. Now, I said, gospel promise was given to Abraham. What are the promises of God given to Abraham in the Old Testament? Hello, those of you, if you've been in the Sunday school before, if I ask you, what kind of promises God gave to Abraham? And some of you may say, oh, God promised Abraham to give a son, a child. Good. What else? Is there anything else? Oh, God promised Abraham to make him into the big, huge nation, multiplying them. Good. Anything else? Oh, God promised Abraham to give him the land as their inheritance. Good. Then, what God promised to Abraham was nothing but just bringing the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, into the existence. That's it? Is that it? Nothing more? Nothing beyond that? And them living in the Canaan land? And to that, Paul is saying in this text, no. What God promised to Abraham was far more than that. Would you look at verse 16 with me in our text? Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Paul is pointing out, at the core of God's promise given to the person, Abraham, there was Christ. Paul is paying a attention to the, even to the details of the Holy Scripture. Even whether the word is in singular form or plural form, Paul is saying that matters. We can count on to on this Bible to that degree, whether the word is in singular or plural. And Paul is saying the word was singular, not offsprings in plural, but one offspring, and that is referring to Christ, the Messiah. For example, if I turn your attention to Genesis chapter 22, it will be on the screen, verse 17. It says this, I will surely bless you, God is talking to, speaking to Abraham, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand of, that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring, that one offspring, 
Shall all the nations of the earth be blessed? Multiply, I'll make into the great. But how come God does not speak in the plural form of springs? How come He speaks in singular form? In your offspring. And your offspring will possess the gate of his enemy. You know what that means? It is talking about kingship. Possessing the gate is a power. It's symbolically power of a city or a nation. To possess the gate of your enemy. The king will come from your offspring. And in him, nations will be blessed. In that one person. And Paul is saying that person is not just Isaac. That person is the Christ, Messiah. Brothers and sisters, there is a reason why Matthew, in his gospel, the gospel of Matthew, why he began his book by providing a genealogy as he was targeting the audience who are familiar with, who are familiar with Old Testament. And in that genealogy, as Matthew tried to introduce Jesus to you, Matthew clearly makes a connection between Jesus and all the way to Abraham. Abraham and Jesus. While Luke also has a genealogy in the Gospel of Luke, Luke makes a connection between Jesus all the way to Adam. But Matthew does not go there. Matthew makes a connection from Abraham to Jesus try to communicate to the readers that Jesus is the offspring promised to Abraham who will come as a Messiah, the son of David. There's a reason why Matthew said that. Verse 8 of our text. Would you look at verse 8 of our text, please? Have the Bible with you, in front of you. You're not learning my ideas, you're learning Bible. Right? Verse 8, it says, And the scripture, foreseeing, you see the word foreseeing? That means looking into the future, what is coming. That God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Did you know that? I want you to catch that part. Beforehand, way in advance. Paul is saying the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached even to Abraham. It was in the Old Testament. The gospel is not something made up, invented, created later in time of Jesus. No, there is gospel even in the Old Testament and that was preached to the Abraham. Where? How? Gospel was there when God began his work of redemption. When God chose Abraham, Abraham, follow me. Even from that moment, all these were in the plan and the mind of God. And then it says, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Now Paul is pointing out this. There was gospel in the Old Testament to Abraham. And the gospel was preached to Abraham in the form of God promising blessings to him. God promised blessings to Abraham. What do you mean? What blessings? Uh, we thought it's like having a child, Isaac. Nation, Israel, and the land of Canaan? Is there more than that? Yes. So number two, what are the promised blessings given to Abraham? I'll show you this. One, I'm going to just point out three blessings. One, verse 13. Look at verse 13 of our text. God redeemed us, Christ redeemed us, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What was promised to Abraham? Redemption from the curse of sin, curse of God on our sin. That was promised. Where did you get that idea? Well, make a mental note on this. I'm going to come back to this a little later. Okay, I'm going to explain this. Where I think the Paul got this from. What story, what part of the Abraham story Paul was looking at thinking, yes, this was promised to Abraham. I'll show you soon. Number two, verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by the promise, by promise, but God gave it to Abraham. Oops, sorry, verse 14. My bad, verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What was promised? The Holy Spirit to his children. Promise of the Holy Spirit to his children. 
Because what is being promised to Abraham is not only physical children, all the nations, that Abraham's going to be a father of nations. Or a father of other ethnic groups, other nations, he's going to be that. Obviously, God was not talking about just physical father. That he's going to have spiritual children. How are they going to be a spiritual children? By having faith after the father Abraham. Through the Holy Spirit. It was implied that they're spiritual children through the Holy Spirit. Number three, eternal inheritance, verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it, is, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. What was promised to Abraham? Inheritance. Now, this inheritance is not simply the Canaan land. Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 10 says, Abraham believed and looked forward and upward the land of promise, the inheritance. Even if I die, I will receive that inheritance. A city whose designer and the builder is God. That he believed that he will inherit the kingdom of God. That was promised to him. Romans chapter 4 verse 13 says this, For the promise to Abraham, and to his and his offspring that he will be the heir of the world. What heir? Nothing happened in Abraham's, Abraham's life. You look into that story. Nothing actually fulfilled in Abraham's story in his life. That but he believed that he's going to be the heir of the world. What heir of the world? Did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Verse seventeen, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. You will have a spiritual children all over the world. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, Abraham believed that, who gives life to the dead and call things, calls into existence the things that do not exist. Abraham believed God who gives life to the dead. In other words, Abraham believed in the resurrection. Abraham believed in the resurrection. Hebrew, author of the Hebrew says in chapter 11 that even if Abraham killed his son Isaac, he believed. But this is a promise on God. You said through him you will make into a great nation. But what if, what's going to happen after killing him? Abraham believed that God will bring the dead into life in the resurrection. Abraham believed in the coming inheritance that he will be the heir of the world. Now look at all this then. The redemption from the curse, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and eternal inheritance. That was promised to Abraham, and Paul says, you see that? Gospel was promised to Abraham. Gospel was preached to Abraham, even in the Old Testament. And Abraham believed in that God's promise, and that was counted to him as righteousness. So number three, the promise were secured by unmerited covenant, by the unmerited covenant. God not only gave the promises to Abraham, but God sealed it, secured it by making a covenant with Abraham that we see in the story of Genesis chapter 15. Now, brother, sister, stay with me. The covenant is the key idea here which Paul focused on, and Paul explains in verse 15. Now, what is covenant? Covenant is a two parties coming together to mutually agreed term, right? That's a covenant. Let me put it in this way. Let's say you are making a contract for a leasing of a car, all right? So one party promised to provide you a certain specific car for specific length of period of time term. And the other party promises, giving promise to each other, promise to pay money, certain amount of money, monthly for this long. Good. Agreed. Signed. Contract is done. Mutually agreed promise. Contract. Now, once that contract is established or ratified, you cannot change or add anything to that. Let's just say one year later, the company, the company cannot go and say, you know what, we thought about it. We want you to do more. We want you to pay $500 more per month. 
And you know what? We're going to add this to the contract. You cannot take your car, the car, outside of the California. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. They cannot add or change that once it is ratified. No one can unuse it, cancel it. No one can add to it. And that is exactly what Paul is pointing out about covenant too. Look at verse 15. Would you look at verse 10, 15? Paul says, To give a human example, brothers, even a man-made covenant, no one unnews it or adds to it once it has been ratified. And Paul is pointing out the fact that God made the covenant with Abraham about those promises of gospel promises that I will give you these blessings. And he made a covenant with him, not based on the works of Abraham. Abraham, if you do this, if you don't do this, then I will do this and you do this. Let's mutually make a covenant in that way. That's not what God did. Abraham simply believed. And God made a covenant with him. In fact, Paul highlights this part. Law was not even there in the time of Abraham. It was not even given to him. Look at verse 17 of our text. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. The law came 430 years later after the Abraham's lifetime through Moses. The law was not even there. Then how can Abraham keep the law? There was no law. Abraham, when God made a covenant with Abraham, that I will bless you in this way, Abraham was not even circumcised. But these people are saying, oh, you need to keep the law in order to be justified before God. You need to be circumcised. Yeah, not only believing in Jesus, you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. No. Abraham was not justified by the words of the law. Are you saying that between time of Abraham all the way to Moses, during that time period, because there was no law, you're saying that nobody was saved because no one was able to keep the law because there was no law. Our salvation is not by keeping the law. Just like Abraham, by believing in God's promises. Abraham believed gospel blessings that was given to him apart from the law. I want to turn your attention to Genesis 15 story. And I want you to know and understand how actually God made that covenant with Abraham in that story. Right? It's going to be on the screen. Let me read it for us. Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That's the Paul is quoting in Galatians. Verse 7, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur from Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he says, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, How can I be sure? How do I know? So God is making a covenant. I'm going to make sure that you can believe this. That I'll give you, I'm making a covenant with you. So he says, Verse there, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half. And lay each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Pause. This may sound strange to you. 
what? So they get the animal, they cut the animal in half, and facing against each other, putting them on the ground, setting them. Yeah, that's what's going on here. Cutting the animal, get those animals, cut them in half against each other. That was actually the custom of the ancient Near Eastern world when they make a covenant. When we make a contract, we sign on a document. And you know, you just make a signature right on it. That's not how they did it. How they make a covenant was cut, cutting the animal in half and putting them against each other on the ground. And the two parties they're making a covenant basically walk between those dead animal carcasses. Signifying that you and I, we will keep this covenant. If any one of us do not keep this covenant, curse shall fall upon that person just like these dead animals. In other words, even if it takes me death, I need to die. I will keep this promise to you. Curse shall fall upon me if I do not. Even if I need to bear a curse on me, I will keep this promise. That's how they made the covenant. Actually, so, in the original Hebrew language, they do not say they make covenant. You know, we say we make covenant, we make contract. They do not say make. They say in their language, the verb is cut. They cut the covenant. That's how they say in the Bible. They cut the covenant. Notice in that story, God making covenant with Abram, and there's a birds of prey just flying over those dead animal bodies, right? That signifies a biblical symbolic language of curses, death. And this says, dreadful, thick, great darkness fell upon Abram. So if you keep reading this story, Abram could not do anything, did not do anything. Look at verse 17 of that chapter. It's going to be on the screen. And God promised to Abram, and this is what God said. And after that, this is what happens. Verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these dead animal pieces, bodies. On that day, Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land, blah, 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 blah. The promise was confirmed again. Now, what we're seeing is only God, I mean, God is spirit. He appeared before Abraham in the form of smoking pot and burning torch. And only God passed, walked between those dead animal carcasses. Not Abraham. Abraham did not walk between them. In other words, Abraham did not make the commitment to this covenant. There was nothing required from Abraham. Hey, Abraham, walk between this. Hey, you promised to do, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. There was nothing. Only God walked between them and made one-sided commitment covenant to Abraham. I will do this. And God was saying, even if death comes upon me. Even if I need to bear curses that these animals represent on me, I will keep this covenant with you and I will surely bless you. I will do it. And you know where this story is taking us to? Sending his son to bear our curse on the cross to fulfill this to bless us, to keep the promise of the Holy Spirit and eternal inheritance, to bring nations and redeem them from curses. Remember the story of Abraham, that Abraham, God demanded Abraham to offer his son Isaac, and he brought it and about to kill his son Isaac. Why was Abraham doing that? Because this is the promised son. Abraham knew and understood the life of son was God demanding the price of his sin for the sins of Egyptians God struck the sons the firstborn son of Egyptian people at the exodus Abraham understood that 
But when he was about to kill his own son Isaac on the mountain Moriah, and you know the story, God says, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch your son. And there we see the, something very important. Everybody, Abraham believed something. You know what he said? He says, on this mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. What's going to be provided? What do you mean, Abraham? What are you trying to say? Abraham believed for the price of my sin to redeem me from curses, not my son. God will provide the lamb for the price of my sin. And on that exam mountain of Moriah, did you know that Christ Jesus died on the mountain? The cross of Jesus Christ stood on the mountain of Moriah just outside of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 13 of our text. This is what I meant. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Church, let me point this out to you. The righteous shall live by faith. Living by faith means you live by trusting in God's promises, just like Abraham did. To live by the law is to live by works. Law tells you, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, all bunch of do's and don'ts. And you live by the law, then you are making what you have done and what you can do as your foundation. I live by it. But the promise of God tells you, well, the law says do and don't, the promise of God tells you, I am and I will. He always tells you who he is. I am and I will. And the righteous shall live by faith, trusting who he is and what he has promised to you. And you live by faith, his promise and who he is becoming your foundation, your strength. The righteous shall live by faith, trusting who he is and what he said he will do for me. And it was counted to him as righteous. Let me end with this one, number four. So who are the sons of Abram? That's the question we began this message. Whether you are a son of Abram or not, that matters. Because the gospel blessings were promised to Abraham and to his children in the offspring of Jesus Christ. So are you a family member of Abraham's? Verse 7 of our text says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Who share the faith like Abraham, they are the sons of Abraham. John 8 verse 39 says this, these answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, then you will be doing the works of Abraham did. Did you get that? These Jewish religious leaders were boasting, You know what? Abraham is our ancestor, our patriarch. We are physical children of Abraham. And Jesus said to them, to those two religious leaders, You know what Jesus actually told them right after that? Actually, your father is the devil. Devil is a murderer from the beginning. He lied. He's a liar from the beginning. Father of lies. And you do exactly what devil does. The idea is this. The child, son, will do exactly what father does. If you are Abraham's children, then you will do the same thing what Abraham did. And you say, Abraham saw me, believed in me, and rejoiced in me. But you're not. The son is just like the father. Not just in the personality, not look resemblance in that way. But the idea is that the son does what father does. In the ancient world, if the father is a fisherman, guess what son's going to do? Being a fisherman. If father was a carpenter, guess what the son's going to do? 
almost no exception. Sons becomes a carpenter, baker, baker, so and so. Son, so who the daddy is, the father is, that took the huge part of one's identity. You know, when you read the Bible, when it introduced somebody, it does not go by Billy and last name, John. They don't identify somebody by last name. You know how they say that? Son of so-and-so. For example, the son James, son of JVD. Whose son it is always a big part of who the person is, the identity, because son is belong to the father. If Abraham is your father, you will do just like him. In the book of James says there, Abraham, you know, faith is not just mentally agreeing. Oh, I, I, I believe in Jesus. Abraham believed, guess what? He left everything and went to a place where he did not know where he was going. Abraham believed, so he took his son Isaac and about to kill him. Abraham believed, so he lived according to the faith. You live by faith. Faith accompanies, begets actions. You are justified by faith. But genuine true faith always will show you living it out. Righteous shall live by faith. That's how Abraham lived, believing God and following. So, if you are his children, believe and you live by that faith. And they are the beneficiary of this promise given to Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, this chapter, towards the end, it says this, there is neither Jews nor Greek. Oh, we are physical children of Abraham. No, no Jews, no Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one. In Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are the heir according to the promise. Father Abraham and many sons, many sons have Father Abraham. I am one of them. So are you. Are you? So let's pray the Lord. Because the promise is yours. The righteous shall live by trusting those promises of God. Let's pray.